Hey everyone, before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. You should be actively excited about this time because it's going to be easier to team build and ship products than it will be during the bull market. It's kind of like what I would imagine it is to be an investor training yourself to get excited when assets sell off. Um, it's probably just like a little bit of mental reframing that you need to go through. You mean like masochism? Like mas- <laughs> like straight <laughs> masochism. Like, 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 yeah. You can call it as it is, right? Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Empire. So now we, we, we're we doing a little bit of a interesting setup here. We have Michael from Framework. Hey, Michael. Um, and we're interviewing Jason and Michael, um, who obviously need no introduction, but they are the co-founders of BlockWorks. And, you know, full disclosure, you know, recently Framework, myself and 10T, we all put some money in a, in a BlockWorks. And at least for me, and I think also Michael, uh, tell me if I'm speaking out of hand, but, you know, We've been working with these guys for a bit of time. We've been doing the podcast and they made a lot of sense, at least for me, to just get involved, have a little bit more skin in the game. And in this process, it's been great to get to know these guys, get to know the business. So figured, hey, why not actually have a pod where we talk about the inside story of a lot of what we share in Empire is, you know, founder stories. And so I think it's going to be a good one. So guys, welcome to the show. Good Thank to be you, on sir. your show, Santi. <laughs> flip flip <laughs> yeah. the mic today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, I mean, I think a lot of times when when we people look at a business, they see, wow, it's been so successful. And they don't really understand what went on, the process from, you know, A to B. And hopefully we get to share those stories. So why don't we just start in you guys telling us how all this came about, you know, tell us a little bit about the story of BlockWorks and um, how it, uh, in the early, the early days. I always, I always say BlockWorks is all Jason's fault. So Jason, you, you tell the story better than me. You, you do the honors, just lead us off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, Mike and I are buddies from, from college. We both went to school down in Atlanta. I'm from San Francisco. He's from Boston met down in Atlanta. We both moved to New York together. We were both, uh, living in the same kind of crappy New York apartment right after school together. And, uh, I was, uh, I was, I was pretty into, I was going to say crypto, but it wasn't even crypto at the time. It was just Bitcoin. Um, and it was pretty into Bitcoin. And then uh, I remember Sunday afternoon, I went to this uh, I went to this kind of like meetup to go learn about this thing called Ethereum. And it was the uh, it was Amanda Gutterman, uh, who is now the who now runs Serotonin, who used to be the CMO of Consensus. And she was giving this talk on on uh, on Ethereum. And I got there mistakenly an hour early. I think it was a 3 p.m. event. I got there at 2 p.m. And I heard this talk from this guy share this story about like building a consulting firm. And I was like, all right, like, I heard, heard this talk about building a consulting firm for like an hour, then go into this thing, learn about Ethereum. And I come back and uh, living with a couple of guys and, and Mike was one of them. And I was like, all right, fellas, we're, uh, we're creating a consulting firm to help big enterprises get into Ethereum. You know, not even really knowing what that meant. This is when, I don't know if you guys remember this, like, you know, Walmart putting their supply chain on the blockchain and kind of all those enterprise, you know, blockchain type things. And uh, this is like 2016. Memory, I don't know. 2016. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This, yeah, exactly. And this was, this meeting was 2017. And I don't know if Mike remembers it the same. I actually remember Mike being into it for 24 hours. And then the next I day. I was not into it, dude. <laughs> I, remember that. I, remember. I was and not then the next day, idea. he says, this is not a good idea, actually. And he explained why. But Mike, what is your <laughs> memory? That was the, I had a slightly, <laughs> yeah. My memory was like, I don't think this is a good idea. So I was working in a consulting firm at the time. And it, it's, it's a small consulting firm. And we were always up. We had the same prices as like McKinsey and Bain and BCG. And we would compete for business with these guys. And the big thing that you're selling when you're selling a consulting firm is like trust and experience. And preferably that should come from a guy with a bunch of gray hair and like some war stories about, you know, mistakes they made and all this stuff. And it's just very tough to do, especially Jason and I were 23 when we started this and we had no business uh, doing anything like that. So, but that was the, that was the planting of what eventually would become BlockWorks because we were the two guys in our friend group who actually started to take this stuff seriously. And so we would, we 
kind of fell down the same rabbit hole that I feel like people still fall down today, which was for us, it was really podcasts. And I do have this very specific memory of listening to a Tim Ferriss, Naval Ravikant podcast. Jason and I just like picked up Kava to go and sat around our living room playing it. And we're like, pause. Did you understand that? No. Did you want, do you know what an order book is? Should we Google that too? And we just like went through this like two hour long Tim Ferriss podcast. And, and that was the beginning but, of the way, journey. Was, was Kava good back then? And like, I mean, God, now <laughs> Kava like is for like and has always bucks, been right? fire. Yeah, okay. it is the until, best. Until the best. IPO. Nice. Until the IPO. Maybe, okay, maybe you should <laughs> just have invested in Kava as opposed to like you know, this <laughs> stupid crypto thing. You probably would have made more money. <laughs> I mean, so we got a lot wrong in the early days, but one thing that Mike and I got really right. So we, so we, so we started listening to these podcasts. And then what we started doing is I was kind of going to these meetings already. And I started bringing Mike to these meetings and these events. And I don't know if you guys remember these 2017 events. It was like starting to get into the kind of ICO boom, like Bitcoin had pat, you know, started at like a thousand bucks, had hit five thousand, then ten thousand. The events were like on were honestly very scammy and kind of schemy and like uh, like just not great vibes. But once in a while you would hear and someone on stage or you'd meet someone who you were like, they get it. That's that's a kernel of truth in in all of this noise. And um I think we got a lot wrong in the early days, but one thing that we really got right was that we believed in crypto and we believed that crypto would eventually become this huge asset class and that the number of people who would, who would come into the industry would grow by orders of magnitude. And those people were going to demand a much, much, much higher quality source of information. And so what we did is we said, let's go. We went to an event and actually the keynote speaker was uh, none other than Alex Mashinsky. And we're like... <laughs> First person I ever heard spoke uh, talk about crypto live. <laughs> we were like, this guy seems really shady, actually. I've I think our, we had a good gut that. sense there. <laughs> but um, we were looking around in the room. That we're like, there's 200 people here. And they all paid like 100 bucks to go. Maybe we could start hosting events to make some money as we get the consulting firm off the ground. And that's uh, a good way to build trust, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we started hosting events. And our first event was February 2018. And... Uh, yeah, we got like 250 people to come. Mike and I would wake up every single morning before we still had day jobs. We'd wake up at like, I don't know, 4 a.m., rip out like 300 messages a day on LinkedIn. Half the people don't even open it. Half the, you know, maybe 5% of them, 10% of them reply to your message. And 1% of those people end up actually buying a ticket. Do that enough. 300 for me, 300 for Mike, 600 messages a day, 30 days. We got 250 people in the room. Um, I think we made like, and, I don't know, 5K. You would, like similar to consensus, you would charge for these um, events and who would show, who would be talking? Like, what would these events be like? We got Adam Helfgott, who now, who runs a company called Mad Hive. We got these guys from Crescent Crypto, who... Oh, yeah. Shout out. Shout out, fellas. Yeah. Fellas. I don't think they still, I don't think there's, I think they're still around in the industry, but the Crescent Crypto doesn't still exist. And then my boss. Because... Oh, yeah, you're Shout out Ryan, who is still a very good friend of mine. Uh, but the, I was trying to convince him to, hey, we should do something with blockchain. You know, it was blockchain, not crypto back then. And I actually, uh, my current employer sponsored the event and he spoke about, he actually spoke about moving from white paper into action, which he came up with that like on the fly. I actually think that'd be a pretty good talk right now. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So one one, one question I, I kind of want to dig in is actually going back a little bit. And like, did you guys always know, you know, like from an early age or, you know, in college that you wanted to build something versus have a job? Or where did this like kernel of entrepreneurship come from? I, I think Those are one, very different one, answers. One, one, of, one of us did. Yeah, one of us did. One of us did. I, I my, I mean... I don't think I was ever really going to work a nine to five. I mean, I did after school, but like my, the, the dream always was to go build something. I mean, I remember, actually, I don't fully remember this, but my mom tells me stories of, I used to buy, um, I used to buy trading cards on eBay that I would find and they would have bad marketing. So I'd find trading cards where like someone took a bad picture. The copy was all bad. I would buy the trading card, take better photos of it, re-upload it to, to eBay with just better marketing copy and make the arbitrage there just with better marketing. So I, th I think I was like always trying to build something. And um, I had a bunch of <laughs> failed ideas that I pulled Mike into some of them and he lost money on all of them. And then uh, I think Blockworks, <laughs> Blockworks is the first thing that I've ever gotten Mike into that he's ever made money on. So I think he's happy about that. <laughs> yeah. I actually lost money following Jason into a very early MEV searching scheme, which is that when <laughs> tickets get dropped in the primary market, 
Uh, you then go scoop up tickets and then resell them on StubHub or something like that. And I actually remember Jason had a friend who did this full time. And he told us about this sure thing that was coming up. Like sure thing, got to buy these tickets as soon as they go up. It was a Jerry Seinfeld, uh, Jerry Seinfeld stand up in Manitoba in February. And I was like, this sounds, this sounds uh, controversial. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get like eight tickets and I lost a thousand bucks. I never resold those tickets. So yeah, I've, I've uh, lost money. That was my only uh, attempt at MEV searching in real life. I mean, you can but, still do it for Tay Swift. I mean, I think I was like about these things are going I was, I would, Yeah, that would probably, yeah. <laughs> Your buddy's probably yeah, raking it in. We should hit him up, Jason. But absolutely, <laughs> uh, I was I'm I was the opposite of Jason. I I had no interest in. I was actually, you know, my dad's a very smart guy. He had a a, a good career, but he did um he did this one thing. Was he so he used to be an investment banker in Boston, and he left to start his own firm, uh, a boutique investment banking firm, in late two thousand seven. So you can imagine that was just about the worst time that you could have done. And I have kind of this memory of this financial stress at this very formative time of my life. And so I was like, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I, my, the, pro, the consulting firm that I worked at was uh, consult, half consulting, half private equity. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to move into private equity. I'm just going to do the safe, easy thing. And that lasted about 16 months. <laughs> so obviously then, it, was, then, it was in the blood at some point, but yeah, I was uh, not planning on doing that. And what was it about Yano that convinced you to join up with him? Have you seen this face, Michael? <laughs> I'll ask myself that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yano has, Yano has a lot of superpowers that I really appreciate. The, one, of the, one of the best is, is um, what we're talking about here, just the ability to network and like just build these connections. Anyone who's met Jason you know, knows that, but that's the one nice thing I'll say about you on this podcast. You know, I'll spend the rest of the podcast. <laughs> what so if you take, like, go, ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, obviously the business sounds like started as an events, um, kind of thing. And then it morphed into something more than that, which is now, you know, media. And then now you've launched research. Um, I'm sure along the way you like, I want to understand kind of the process by which you then decided to go into these different categories. Mm. Cause a lot of times you can, you can get pulled in a million directions, especially in crypto, right. Which is so early and like you can think about like trying to boil the ocean. Right. But um, yeah, maybe talk through us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. We like to joke that we've basically built a media company ass backwards. And what, what I mean by that is uh, if you look at how most media companies are built, they typically start with, um, with content first. They typically start with like a, a sub stack or a newsletter or maybe a podcast. And it's like a very content driven person, kick, you know, kind of kicking it off. And then maybe a year in or 18 months in, they, they kind of have this realization like, oh, crap, we got to monetize this thing. Um, and so what they start doing is they say, how do we monetize? Oh, look, we've got an audience. Why don't we go host like a live podcast or like an event or something? Or uh, why don't we go sell some sponsorships on, the, on, this, on this podcast? We didn't have the luxury of doing that because we didn't go raise a whole bunch of money from day one. Like a lot of the companies, I mean, you guys were busy funding them. Like we didn't do that route. We didn't go raise a bunch of venture money. We, we bootstrapped the first five years of BlockWorks. So we had to do things that made money from day one. And I can tell you that like, you know, uh, like, I don't know, putting, putting out content from day one was not a super profitable thing to do. So what we did was we started with events and we figured out how to make the events be a cash flow positive business. Once we figured out how to do that, we got into the next thing, which was podcasts. But even with podcasts, we didn't get into creating our own shows for, I think it took three years, right? I think, so the first, what we, the first podcast we ever did was with, uh, was with Pomp, Anthony Pompliano. And um, we helped him build his podcast. He didn't have a podcast. And then he kind of said, I need, I want to create a podcast. We did it with him. Then we did it with Meltem and Jill. If you like Meltem Demirs and Jill Carlson, mm -hmm. then we did one with Selkis. Then we did one with Charlie Shrem. And then once those were spitting off enough cash flow, we then invested in our own content. And we kind of did that like step by step by step. And it wasn't until actually kind of this huge crisis, probably the biggest crisis moment of the company, which was COVID, that we said, look, this it's either now or never. We either go full-blown media company, launch a launch a new, a new website, spend all the money we have, and uh, hire reporters and editors and and get into the news business, or or I don't know what we're doing here. Um, and that's so, what we did. 
So I want to get into COVID. I think that's going to be a really interesting subject kind of in general, but I'm also curious, like what other things did you guys come up with? Any good harebrained ideas or random thoughts that <laughs> you attempted and never <laughs> followed through with? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, unfortunately, we followed through with some of them. They we followed through with some of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had a, before we did anything related to our own content, we had a influencer marketing business where we would connect sponsors with like, hey, you know, if you want 10 accounts to tweet about you or something like that, we would kind of connect them. And we tried that for a couple months. It was never really a big thing for us, but it, and it was a nightmare. It was, I still have like, I feel <laughs> only, stressful only, just only even for talking crypto? about that. Yeah, only, only for crypto. crypto. Yeah. It's yeah. actually really embarrassing. Some, so it's actually, some people did it, like some of the kind of influencers you see on Twitter, like they did it, but some like... We didn't really understand who were like the real big names, like the important people versus not the important people. We were just like, oh, they have 200,000 Twitter followers. So sometimes I'll go message someone like, Santi, I'd be surprised if, if you scroll to the top of our DMs if there's not like, hey, Santi, you've got a brand that wants to pay you 50K. No, no. <laughs> you know, funny you mention that because uh, I, I remember uh, I, I was a Parify and I reached out to you guys and said, hey, we should do a podcast on DeFi. And both really? of you laughed at me and said, what the hell is DeFi? Like, go go, go do your normal job. <laughs> and, and then, I remember this. I, I remember like, that too. Well, like, you know what, Santi? Do you, do you want to know the real story of that was, A, we didn't understand DeFi like you did back then. And we didn't realize it was going to be as big. But B, we were, everything had to make money. Every single thing had to make money. And I actually remember that conversation really well. It was this woman, Gina, who was our first salesperson. She was like, I have this weird opportunity. They, they want to create a podcast. I was like, what are they going to pay us for it? And you guys were like, we're not paying you to go create a Should podcast. Go and we're like, well, then we don't want to do it. And, <laughs> yeah. and like, I don't know if it's a regret. Mike, I don't know if you'd call this a regret or just a necessity. But like we did things in the early days that really weren't IP. They weren't valuable to the business. Like we hosted other, we hosted the Multicoin Summit for Multicoin for years. We, uh, oh, know. you know, we did this influencer wow. thing. We hosted other people's events, like, and we didn't invest in our own content. And looking back, it's easy to say like, oh, we should have just invested in our own content from day one. But it's a, uh, we did those things because we had to it's say a DNA a lot. thing. It's a DNA thing that I wouldn't trade, honestly. Like, uh, I think a, a lot of companies in crypto have too long term of a mindset and they don't focus on building sustainable businesses and that puts them in bad spots. So well, well, I think there's a transition. Longer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you have to make that transition though, right? You have to be able to say, hey, instead of just going to go off and, and you know, make the bucks here, I got to take right. this and reinvest it, build my own IP, you know, yeah, all the things that you're doing now. But that is a transition, I would imagine. It is. Yeah. And that for, that for us was COVID. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you guys like b before COVID? Because I, I mean, I got to assume that your events business has evaporated overnight. But before we get there, like, during the ICO craziness, did you ever think about raising money? Because like everyone under the sun was being thrown money at. And if you would have like talked to investors and said, hey, we're, we're generating money, I assume some of your competitors raised a bunch of money. Was that ever a thing that you guys thought about? So you got to, uh, so to kind of line up the timeline of Blockworks on top of the timeline of the ICO boom and that, and that, in that cycle, we launched the business the third week of December, which if you look at CoinGecko, we liter you, you could put the founding of Blockworks on the literal top of Bitcoin. And for the first like two and a half years of Blockworks, it was the price was down only. So it's not like we had Blockworks in 2016, market starts ripping, we could go launch a token or something. It was just down only. Um, and so like, I don't think we really even thought about that because I don't think that opportunity existed. But also I think, um, Again, I'm sure Mike and I got a lot wrong over the years, but like we, one thing we got right was like just gut sense around like what fundamentally makes sense as a business and what people make sense to do business with. And so I think we've avoided a lot of like the scammers, the scams. We've done things for the business that like logically make sense and maybe weren't as like exciting and didn't have the fireworks, but is the reason that Blockworks is, you know, we're coming up on six years soon. So yeah. COVID, <clears throat> March twenty twenty, <laughs> all set to go and have all the all, all the many events I'm sure you had scheduled. I mean, I, I remember going to the first framework event with Vance in Chicago that was hosted by Blockworks. That was more of like a, a fund one. I mean, you guys were doing all kinds of events, um, and I just remember seeing you know 
by block works, by block works for every single thing that we were you know, thinking of attending. Um, I'm sure it was a major business line. What happened? Yeah. Um, I'm just reliving some of the pain of that particular period mm-hmm. of time. That was a, a mental low point uh, because, you know, to take you back there, we didn't have any media business. We had two lines of business. We had events that we hosted and that was 70% of the revenue or something like that. And then we had these outsourced podcasts that we were a production and sales force for, and we had a rev share on. And when COVID happened, I, viv- I vividly remember this. It was it was right before New York Blockchain Week, for folks who will remember what that is. And we actually made the first call to shut our conference down uh, before like consensus and token summit and whatever else used to be hosted during that week. And I think there was just a sense of like, what are we going to do? Because that, you know, if you if you look at the intersection of sectors that got hit by crypto, because remember, it took a while for Bitcoin to rip. So simultaneously, we were at this, this nexus or like this Venn diagram of like industries that got impacted by COVID, which was like crypto and conferences. It was like, <laughs> we, were like we were like right at the center of, of where you did not want to be. And it really, it was an existential, it was definitely an existential conversation. And I think we just, for the first time, you know, it's very easy in a startup land to just get one foot in front of the other, go chase the money, go do this thing. But we didn't have anything to go chase. Our whole business just got ripped out from under us. So it actually kind of gave us this chance to sit down and think, what are we actually building here? And what do we want to build? And what makes sense? So, what we actually did was, um, Jason and I and our um, our our COO Julie Muroff, she we we all went to New York. We did this like three day in depth kind of like what do we want to do as a business, and we didn't actually figure it out then. But we moved the ball forward, and eventually, what that became was this like it happened over a span of like two months of these just like really tough meetings where like it seemed like we were disagreeing and we weren't saying the same thing, but we moved one important thing. And what we found was that we wanted to do a B2B media model. That was the model that we saw that made sense. B2C being like you create a really large top of funnel like CNBC, all of the people that are in there are very general and kind of commoditized and you sell that to like a big um, media agency or B2B is like very industry specific and you sell these kind of more bespoke contracts. And we just set, and we just literally set about building that. Um, I don't know if you remember it any differently, you know, but that was kind of, no, I mean, we just got in a room together. We, I mean, we looked at every, I have a, I still have this media spreadsheet of, I think every single media business in the world, basically, and how much revenue do they have employees? And then I'll just reach out to people who worked at these media companies like Politico. And I'd be like, Hey, you have Politico pro. They do like 50 million in subscription revenue, probably even more at this point. How that? How does that business work? What does that look like? And then we would, so we would have those conversations and then we would talk to our customers. And for us, our customers at that point were just people who kind of, we like knew and they attended our, like there were attendee conferences uh, or attendees of our conferences. And we were like, what do you guys need? And one thing that kept coming up was like, uh, there are editorial sites in crypto, but none of them do an incredible job. Like you have a couple of brands, but like no one's doing a world-class job of covering the industry. And I think at one point, Mike and I and Julie looked at each other and said, like, why can't we do that? Um, and so we said, all right, what do we need? We need a new website. Took us about nine months to fully redesign, rebrand. We used to be Blockworks Group to Blockworks and build this new website. We hired our, we hired three, we launched with three reporters and one editor. And, uh, and we were off to the races. That was January 12th, 2021. And mind you, at this time, you already had what I think are your biggest competitors already existed at the time, the block, uh, yeah. Coindesk. And then. Yeah. Coindesk had been around, you know, since 2014 or 15 decrypt launched 2018, the yeah. block launched 2018. Um, coin telegraph. Yeah. So a lot of times when, when I meet a founder, Michael, you probably, you always ask him about competition and I don't have a good sense. Like there's not like a uniform answer of what I want to hear. But what I don't want to hear is someone that says, oh, there's no competition. Because uh, then I think that to me is a huge red flag. If the founder is just like, you know, oblivious or whatever. How did you guys, but I remember like, that could be also 
I'm curious to understand, like from your perspective, those businesses were probably already a bit more far along than you guys. So what did you, what gave you the conviction that this was something that you had an edge over these guys? And you said, Hey, we can do a better job. I mean, you certainly can do a better job mm-hmm. than Bloomberg and all the other idiots that just portray the industry like terribly. But like, what made you think that you could do a better job than the crypto focus specific media groups? What we did well is we had one target at all times. We didn't say like, hey, there's like seven companies who are competitors. We said, we, there is one company, they're the competitor and we're gonna go after them. And for us, and I think that's a helpful framework for businesses. And for us, the 800 pound gorilla in media was Coindesk back at the time. And we said, what is Coindesk's? They have like 10 times the amount of employees that we have, 10, probably a hundred times the amount of funding because you know, Barry and DCG and stuff, what is their weakness? And For them, their weakness was actually something that I didn't realize at the time was a weakness of a lot of other crypto companies, but they made the mistake that I think a lot of other crypto companies end up making, which is they hit a certain level of scale. And then they said, we need to go higher from from TradFi or for them, it was from traditional media. So Coindesk, I have like a ridiculous amount of respect for Coindesk and people who work there. And I think their news team is amazing. They made this crucial mistake, which is they went and, you know, they probably hit like 50 employees and said, We need to scale. How do we do that? We're going to hire from Bloomberg and CNBC. And the second they did that and brought on the new executive team of, you know, people who didn't really understand crypto, that's when their back was against the wall. I don't know if they knew that, but I think that's, that's, I'm not even sure this is true, but that's what we saw. And we said that that's our opening. So. I mean, like, I want to understand that point a little bit more. Like what is wrong with hiring people from those places? I think it's a big, I'd be curious you guys might bump into this or founders might ask you about this. There's a real challenge that happens, I think, in scaling a crypto company where it's very rare to get sort of a senior leader who both has deep domain expertise, but also treats crypto as a real thing. What is much more common is you achieve some amount of success in crypto with crypto natives then you say, hey, we should look at, for instance, the Bloombergs of the world that have done this extremely well and take the lessons that that they have and bring it in here. And so you do that. And it doesn't have to just be Bloomberg or I actually think Bloomberg does a pretty good job. But um, but but other, you know, could be a really senior marketer or really senior sales guy or something like that. And that person comes in, they don't have a real belief in the industry. And they say, this is what has worked in the past. And I'm just going to carbon copy this right onto this company. And like, I'm going to crush it. And it never works. It, it like to a T like very, very rarely seems to work. And I'm not really sure why that is. I'm not sure if crypto is just its own beast or if it's too early for a lot of the stuff that eventually will make sense to work. But you see these kind of seasoned executives try to take what worked for them in another industry and carbon copy it onto this one. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem to work. And we, the simple insight that Jason is talking about was at this point, we actually built BlockWorks with like a thesis that was semi-right and semi-wrong um, about ta- like who we wanted to speak to. And we had learned kind of at this point that the people that really knew what they were talking about weren't. I don't want to offend anyone. It it was really like the developers and the builders that were like at the front lines. Those were the people that we talked to and had our socks blown off and were like, wow, these are really new, interesting ideas. And like they deeply know what they're talking about. It wasn't who you would kind of like the, frankly, the slightly older people in the, the suits. And there, there are really good reasons um, and like contributions that they make, but they weren't the people that knew what was going on and knew what was important. So Jason and I saw our competitors hire a slew of these people and we were like, that seems like the wrong move. I, I, that just doesn't seem right uh, based on what we think. But I think the other element too, Santa, is like, I don't know if this is a good founder answer that you'd look for, if this is a big red flag that you should have asked me before, but there's not really a good answer. <laughs> you know, There's yeah. always competition. They have more money than us. We just, here's, here's the unfortunate we could answer. do it. I, like, yeah. That's, that's the real the, the unfortunate answer, answer that I would love to figure out if you guys have figured out how to suss this out is like, especially in media, it comes down to execution. Can you execute? Mm-hmm. Like, 
And uh, I think media businesses are a little different than, actually, this was probably, Mike and I had a lot of debate. Mike, probably some of our bigger debates or arguments have come from this, um, which is there are in software businesses, a lot of times you have to like out innovate someone in media, you have to out execute someone. And so I think I would look at other businesses in maybe the early days, Mike, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but like, I'd be like, Hey, they're doing this. Let's just go do that, but execute it in crypto and execute better. And Mike would be like, well, we can't, they're already doing that. I'm like, yeah, but we can execute better. And I think in media, that's that, like, that's how you win. Now it's a new muscle that we need to learn how to flex as we're building our software business, which is our research and data and governance platform, because you can't just out execute. You have to like out innovate and think farther ahead than your competitors. So that's a different muscle, but for media, yeah, it's an, it's an execution game. What's your criteria for hiring? Like when you talk about like not hiring a suit from Bloomberg or CNBC or whatever, but you clearly have hired, I don't know how many people are you now? 60 plus. Yeah. yeah. But do you, do you get involved in every hiring decision? Like a lot, a lot like Sergey and Larry from Google. Yeah, Mike, Mike or I still touch every every hire at this point. That's yeah, I mean, it might not be. It's probably at the like you know in the final round or something. But Mike and I are still hands on. Yeah, yeah. and people yeah. talk about this fluffy thing called culture and whatnot. And what would you define like a common denominator framework um, of things that you look for in people, especially like a make or break? Uh, where you say, no, you know what, like might be super talented, mm -hmm. but no, not a good cut for this place. Also, just to say there are, there are very few organizations in crypto that are 60 people plus. And so thinking about it from that respect, where you have to be able to build teams, sub teams, have managers, and all the while maintaining the same perspective that you just described, which is a crypto nativity. Uh, I think that's, you know, hats off, but also, you know, would be very curious to hear more about how you've done that. I will open it up a little bit and just say, uh, I when when we launched Blockworks, I thought the hardest thing that we were going to have to do was build our website or go sell a six-figure sponsorship. The hardest thing by far, and it's not even close by orders of magnitude, is building a team and scaling a team. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that, Mike, but like that is getting, I think you have like three roles as a founder. Set the strategy, push the speed, push things to go faster than they would, you know, things would get shipped if they weren't, if you weren't there. And the third, get people rowing together. And uh, honestly, at this point, like Mike and I spend a lot of time on that third bucket, getting people to row together. And um, yeah, I think it starts with like, who you think about hiring, um, all the way to like, your, yeah, your culture and your values and things like that. I mean, I, I have two traits I look for when hiring, like one is, um, nice people, honestly, like this is, that sounds really fluffy, but like we have this airport test. If you're at the airport with someone and your plane gets canceled, like, are you going to be stoked to go sit at the bar and have a beer with them for eight hours? Or are you going to be like, Oh my God, I have to go sit with Santi for eight hours. Like brutal. And we had the same test. <laughs> to with be fair, we've invest. never actually met in person. So we don't really know this. We <laughs> know permissionless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did, Oops. we even talked about that when we were talking about investors, like we didn't want people who are like, Oh, they have money, but that, you know, we don't actually enjoy them. And, and the reason for that and why it's so important in crypto is there are so many people who have made so much money that it can go to their head really quickly. And we want, like, I think we have a very like empathetic, kind and like generous and nice team. And that was really important for us. The other thing was um, that I look for is curiosity above, above pretty much everything else outside of kindness is um, curiosity. And, the, and there's a real reason for that, which is crypto moves far too quickly to, uh, to not be curious. And if you're not, if you're not naturally curious, you're not going down like weird Wikipedia rabbit holes and weird Reddit and Twitter rabbit holes, like you will just get blown in the dust. Like if you think about what people were talking about in crypto in let's say 2019, 2019 was like prime brokerage, institution, institutional custody, fire blocks. One year later, boom, DeFi summer. If you weren't paying attention, you get completely knocked on your ass. Um, and so I look for curiosity. Mike, what do you think? I would say we have a filter. I agree with everything that you just said. We have a filter, absolute red line. If we catch a whiff of arrogance, it's curtains. I think that's actually probably been the most successful hiring trait. Like we have said no to some extremely successful, extremely qualified people that we were sure could have done the job very well. But you can you can sense it even in an interview setting. And we mm -hmm. just 
do not allow those people in Blockworks. As a media business, uh, to your point, uh, Yano, you get to understand maybe the narratives and the evolution of that and what's like percolating. Um, I've heard both of you say recently that you haven't been as excited. Like this is the moment where you've been the most excited, uh, which, you know, a lot of people might disagree with. What are you seeing? Um, and what have you, like when you put it in perspective of all the different hype that has existed in the industry and you covering it from the media side, like what's different today than maybe perhaps a year ago, two years ago? Um, I don't know if, if that question makes sense. I think in a funny way, there, there actually was a great podcast that Kobe gave like years ago. Uh, it was during the bull market and, you know, this kind of secret to making it in crypto. And it was just find a way to stay interested during this period of time. Really easy to say when everything is ripping and you can say you're interested in it, but really you just want the number to go up and you're just checking your, you know, your MetaMask or CoinGecko or whatever it is. And, uh, uh, it was, it's very difficult at that period of time to parse out the signal from the noise. You also have a lot of people that are frankly making really bad decisions in real time that are getting rewarded for it. And it's very difficult to ferret out which ideas make sense, which protocols are real, what is worth spending my time on. The gift that you've been given now is there is very, there's way less fluff and hype. And the people that are still here are serious people. There's no reason to be here if you're not serious and committed. And one of the things that's changed in the last year and a half is that people are actually focused on solving real bottlenecks. Um, and I don't think that was the case before. It was, you know, the nth uh, DEX or borrow lend protocol with like one little parameter tweaked and it just wasn't particularly exciting. Whereas it's just much more engaging to learn about stuff that's solving actual problems, I would say. And that's, that's what it's been for me, I think. So maybe along those same lines, you know, you've got this team of 60 people. You're also having to keep everybody interested. You're running with all the different narratives and as a media business, you know, deciding how to engage and, and where to engage and where to invest time and resources. Like how do you keep everybody excited and engaged? And not everybody's going to be excited about the bear market as we are who have lived through multiple cycles, but mm -hmm. Like, do you spend time, you know, trying to get them the row in this direction or, or how do you think about that, you know, maintaining excitement and engagement from the team? I think that's really tough because everyone needs something slightly different. Everyone is different on their stage of the particular journey and they need something different. And there's only really so much that you can do. But I think one of the things that this is my own mental model for this. Like the bet that you're taking on crypto, the reason you stomach this volatility that sucks to deal with, because it does, it sucks. Um, it's painful in both directions. It would be better if it just went up in a straight line. But the reason that you stomach that volatility is because what you get is a slope of growth that is much higher once you level out the volatile up and down. And what at least I have tried to do is show people that that's the bet that you're making, right? And like Jason and I have showed this little squiggly line that goes up like this, right? Like this is what the industry does. There is a line that goes through it, be the line that goes through it. And what that means during these crappy times are you have to find a way to remain interested, understand that this is not the end of the world and that this is actually, you should be actively excited about this time because it's going to be easier to team build and ship products than it will be during the bull market. It's kind of like what I would imagine it is to be an investor training yourself to get excited when assets sell off. Um, it's probably just like a little bit of mental reframing that you need to go through. You mean like masochism? Like massive, like straight massive. <laughs> like, 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 yeah. call it as it is, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's easier as an investor, right? Because you're looking at the prices and you're saying, okay, I was able to buy this at X. You yeah, know, if you like it at 60, you're going to like it at 20. Yeah, exactly. But you don't have that immediate feedback in the media business. Maybe instead of, you know, how you think about the team and, you know, kind of getting the excitement and engagement from the team, how do you think about the business? You know, where, where are some of, the, some of the bets that you're making, you know, now as you look to the future? So... The big thing that we've been focused on for the last year is building 
the research part of our business and the data part of our business. And the way this all fits together is we started as a pure play media company, which looks like a funnel. And great media companies have something at the bottom of that funnel. And for us, that's research. And this is the part to Jason's point where this is where you need to get a little bit strategic because you're investing in like R&D in the form of engineering and a strategy here that's like much harder to just pivot um, instead of like being a media company. And I think the the insight that we had for our for our research product was that if you if you talk to people, that there was a period of time in crypto where it's reasonable to say I'm going to be a one stop shop for all data and analytics in crypto, right? That was a reasonable thing at one point, but it's it's not actually a reasonable thing now. It's for like a whole bunch of different reasons. It's first of all, crypto moves too fast and there's too much stuff to cover well, but the engineering lift of doing that is immense. It's extremely, extremely expensive to build a product like that. And so a lot of companies, initially, their value proposition was, we're going to be a one-stop shop. And then you've made this promise to your customer and you've sold yourself on that value proposition. You've locked yourself into a bet that doesn't really make sense. So we we had this idea of starting niche. We were like, instead of covering all of these different sectors and everything, this was where it was a gift. We had limited resources. We didn't even have the opportunity to do that if we wanted to. So we had to pick one niche and we just wanted to do it really, really well. And this is another point where I think there's kind of like an art and a science of like, when do you listen? To, how many times have you been told, just ask your customers, like just talk to your customers. And you kind of have to do that and you have to listen to your customers, but you also need to know when to not listen to them and to have a thesis on the way that this industry is going to play out. And our the- we had like two theses, which is one, start narrow instead of broad and then allow yourself to grow into it. But then the other thing was that eventually sh- crypto is going to shift from mostly a trend following investing space to one which is more based on fundamentals. And those were the two big theses that we had in terms of building out the research product. And it's allowed us to be like tighter and get the the quality, the content, and the data and analytics and the governance stuff better for our little sphere of the universe. And then we can expand out from there. But that's what we've been doubling down and and really building aggressively. Yeah. And, and connecting the two sides of the business, right? Because this is this brand new core competency for us, brand new platform. Um, and for the first year, they were kind of like they were kind of separated, right? You had like the media business and then you had the research business. And now going into year two, um, we are connecting those two businesses so that this proverbial like media funnel that Mike talked about then shoots into, right? We might have like millions of people who hit our website every month for the, you know, to read our news stories, then maybe, you know, you know, a couple hundred thousand on the newsletter, then maybe like 5,000 at the conferences. We need to then convert you know, another 10% of those people into the research platform. So like, I think our research platform, the last three months have been like up only growth, like biggest months that we've ever had on the research platform. We have no salespeople on research yet. We have no B2B sellers. We have no salespeople. We have no, no research marketers. That's all just from this like media funnel going down and converting people. You know, someone might read a news story about DeFi and Blockworks. And then they see that we have a podcast called Bell Curve on MEV. They listen to Bell Curve. Then they see that there's permissionless coming up. They attend permissionless. Then they see our like research booth on site or something like that. And like that's mm-hmm. this funnel that we talk about that is actually starting to work in real time. So that's like, I think Mike is spending a lot of time on the platform. Like, what is the research? Like, what do fundamentals in crypto look like? And then I'm spending a lot of time on like the design and the engineering of the product and then connecting those two businesses together. Now that we're uh, on trends, I am curious to understand where, like, who, who's your audience? Like, where, where do they come from? Are they institutions? Mm. How has that trend line changed and the composition of your, of the people that are visiting your site, listening to our podcasts and whatnot? Like, who are they? Who are these people? I would say we had two, I'm going to let Mike take this. In, so we had two theses at the beginning. One was that crypto would eventually grow to be this huge asset class. A number of people who came into the industry would grow exponentially. They would demand much better information. That thesis was right. The thesis that I think Mike and I are thinking about, whether it was right or wrong and probably wasn't right, was that one thing that we would always say at the beginning was like, we, BlockWorks, puts crypto into the language of institutions. We don't talk about these ZK tech 
roll up things. We, we put it into the language that institutions can understand. That is what I'd call like the old block works. The new block works is like, we are pushing deeper into the dark forest of crypto. And like, if you look at even just the content that we're putting out, it's like zero, the two recent podcasts that we launched, ZRX Research and Bell Curve and, and, and Lightspeed as well. Like we are going deeper into crypto. And because of that, our audience is evolving. And I would say our audience of the first, you know, maybe one to three to four years of Blockworks was like very tradfi institutional audience dipping their toes into crypto. And we were this like safe place for them to go. Now our audience is becoming, I guess I'd call them like power def- power crypto users and people who like work in the industry full time. Mike, I don't know if you would agree with that of kind of adjustment or evolving. I do agree with it. I have stopped. I found it le- one of the interesting things about crypto is that the most sophisticated users of crypto are not necessarily tradfi people. Actually, that's often not the case. And in if you were building a media business in finance, in regular finance, you'd have a really clean, easy job of uh, cutting up your audience because it'd be retail, which is very unsophisticated and wants to consume CNBC type content, and then very sophisticated institutional players. In crypto, it's this weird mishmash where actually sometimes the smaller funds or power users, those are the most sophisticated people in the space. So I find it more useful to carve up our audience into sophisticated and less sophisticated. And if you fit in that bucket of sophisticated users of crypto, then our content is for you. And sometimes that's you guys, Michael and Santi, like you got like crypto native VCs. Sometimes it's Visa. You know, Visa is a great example of a more traditional institution that I would say is like exactly who we're creating. They're really sophisticated. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, but that's where it's it's tougher for me to be like, oh yeah, it's this demographic or this age or whatever. It's we the the content that we want to create and where we feel like we can add value is on the cutting edge of crypto in this industry. Uh, because eventually there's going to be sophisticated market structure and assets and all the same kind of stuff that exists in finance. And some of the old finance incumbents will pivot. And some of them, I think, probably won't or won't be involved as seriously. But that is less of who our customer is. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. Now, you've heard me say this many times on our show before, but the time to be bearish on crypto was 18 months ago when the Fed began raising rates. Since then, our entire market is down more than 50%. We've had all this bad news. In the last two weeks, we had BlackRock and a whole slew of other institutional investors file for a Bitcoin ETF. This space is not going anywhere. So if you're interested in investing in this space at all, I highly recommend that you attend this conference. The other thing, and I've said this before as well, brand market conferences are the best ones. In the fall market, you have all this retail, all this noise. Now you only have the people that are really here building great products. This one is worth your time 100%. And since you are such good listeners to On the Margin, which I really appreciate, giving you all a special 30% discount code. It is Margin30. Now you can access that by clicking the link in the bottom of the show notes. So you can see my fingers pointing down, click that link. Because you are a listener of On the Margin, you get 30% off to the conference. Again, the code is Margin30. We'll see you all there. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of Blockworks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but Blockworks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no brainer. As a listener of On the Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So, again, that's code Margin 10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. So, kind of along the same lines, I mean, and obviously with, uh, you know, uh, mystical ball of prediction. Um, where do you see that changing over the next five or 10 years? Like the audience demographic breaking down and then like, how are you thinking of moving in that direction or serving that audience? So 
I have like a couple couple of different answers there. Um, this is this is more like okay with the revised theses that you just described. You know, one being correct, one being wrong. Like, what are the new theses about where you know you see that changing? Could be right, could yeah. be wrong eventually, but curious. So, I think so. Again, one one more like sort of mental model framework for you is we at different layers of our funnel we have different content. So, like our editorial content at the top of our funnel is kind of the most broad. The podcasts are one layer deeper, which tend to get a little bit more in the weeds. And then the research is only for very technical folks. On the very technical folks level, I think one of the bigger changes that you'll see happen in that audience is I think the like proverbial winners or the folks that will make the transition best from TradFi are the high frequency trading firms. Like they're the ones that understand microstructure uh, in regular TradFi markets. And you already see them, a lot of them are very active, but there's a very directly transferable skill set to market making uh, on a very short time scale in TradFi and all of the stuff that's happening in in you know MEV and building blocks and all that kind of thing. So I think there probably it will become a more, I think there's gonna be a lot of migration actually from TradFi at that level into kind of like that would be the audience for our research sort of content. On the podcast side of things, I actually don't think the audience is going to change that much in the next five years. I think it'll be roughly like what it is now. On the broader audience, I this is where timing is the really tough thing. Michael, I actually really like the thesis that you and Vance have around gaming. I think there will be one or two big consumer apps that bring people in. Maybe it's NFTs, maybe it's gaming, maybe it's something like that. But I think that audience gets a lot more normy on the top of our funnel, if I had to guess. Like that's that's how I see the audience changing over the next like five years. I don't know, Yano, if you think differently. No, I agree. And I think one of our challenges is gonna be I will I uh, I can confidently say that Blockworks covers and puts out research about DeFi better than anyone else in the industry. As the industry gets a much larger top of funnel than it has today. I think that's going to be a decision that we have to make is do we go, you know, do we go launch an NFT section on our site or gaming, or do we start to cover crypto games on the research platform? That's going to be, I would assume a decision we have to make in, you know, 12 to 18 months from now. Um, I think I speak for the industry where we've all in one way, shape or form been frustrated in how this industry gets portrayed by traditional media. And that was a large impetus for me to do the podcast after I left Parify because I said, look, I, I think education, but more like pure education, like, because I think people are really lost in this journey. There's like a big divide between a lot of noise and bad portrayal in traditional media. And then all the influencers out there that are always trying to shell and sell you stuff, but like kind of like under the hood of we're educating. And then there's like what I think you guys are doing, which is more genuine content without an agenda. But like, do you ever, do you ever feel the need or the, like to make this the Bloomberg of crypto, uh, like really go out and try to, I don't know, like convince the more mainstream narrative and, and like control that. Cause I've heard you say all throughout this podcast, we want to be niche. We want to be really focused on our core audience and like, and maybe that was true for since inception, like just for better or for worse, you just had to focus on a few things. But as you have more resources, you keep growing. Like, do you ever see a place in the world where you become that huge media, like media conglomerate that really starts to influence, uh, you know, the millions out there that are getting fed pretty bad information about this industry? I will, my mom has this saying, which is <laughs> you can't make anyone do anything. And she says that to illustrate the point that my sister and I were hellions in high school and put her through a lot. Uh, and she couldn't make us do what she wanted, she wanted us to do. But I think it applies in this situation a little bit. You can't, this was where Jason and I aired in the original thesis for Blockworks. You cannot make someone who does not care about something care by putting it in different language. They simply have to come to crypto within their own frame of thought. And frankly, a lot of the ways that people 
start becoming interested in the space are wrong. I was a consultant. I did supply chain consulting and I was really interested in that. It took me a year to find out that that was completely useless. And everyone is going to come to crypto in their own individual way. And I've actually stopped worrying about that. And I just believe that it's going to happen organically. And the best thing that we can do internally as an industry is just create products that people want. Once people are primed and interested and in using this stuff, that is where I see Blockworks shining and winning and helping move our move us in the right direction. But I don't I don't think it's possible to go out into the world and change people's perceptions. The industry needs to do stuff, create products that people want, solve real problems and change the narrative that way and then we can talk about it in a fair way. I do think traditional media has put itself at a disadvantage. It has covered it so publicly, so loudly, and so wrongly for <laughs> such a long period of time that all we have to do, the way that at least I view it, is we just have to wait for this industry to indisputably prove itself, and then Blockworks will I mean, be they, they, positioned. They portray the internet right. terribly, right? You've seen all those interviews with like, uh, you know, Bill Gates are like, why would you want to build this? And like, yeah. So I guess that's a great point around like consumer. Santi, I have, I, have, I have one more thought. I have, I have one like more thought on that. Have you guys have you guys read the Bloomberg biography? Yeah. yeah. Um, like the, so yeah. it's 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 called Bloomberg by Bloomberg. It's a really good book for anyone who's like building in data or media or anything like that. Bloomberg. People think of so like who are the big media behemoths today in, in finance? It's uh, it's Wall Street Journal and, and Bloomberg, right? Those are like the two probably creme de la cremes. And if you're in Europe, maybe Reuters as well. Um, back then in the eighties, it was, uh, in nineties, it was, it was Reuters and wall street journal. Um, the journal in the, in the U S Reuters in, in Europe, the way that Bloomberg be, got on that, you know, pedestal as and became one of those, like the power players, they didn't just go like try to compete with them from day one. There were actually a lot of interesting partnerships that they did. So the first thing that Bloomberg ever did was they supplied their bond pricing to Reuters. Then they supplied their bond pricing to the journal. Then they syndicated their real time, like breaking news stories to different financial outlets. And I think like for us, like I don't see Bloomberg. I'm not like, boom, the, the, the bad guy's Bloomberg right now. I'm like, no, let's, if we can give investors better information about crypto, we will partner with Bloomberg. One day I could see us competing, but right now, like if you go on the terminal, you'll see Blockworks information. You'll see Blockworks news very soon. Hopefully you'll see Blockworks research stuff. And that's like my, they are. I think we can be helpful to them right now. One day we'll compete, but I think we can be helpful. That's a great point. And Michael, yeah. back to your point, and I want to ask you both, maybe Michael, you as well, but like just curious, like what do you see as the more promising consumer products and applications? I mean, you talk about gaming, obviously, framework. You guys invested a ton in that as well. But from your vantage point, guys, you cover this and you break the stories and, the, and you make the research. Where do you see the most amount of interest and where do you see these the categories that you think are going to have the most amount of legs in the next cycle? Mm. Um, it's very hard to get the broad. I think that's the question we're all asking, right? Which is what is the app that's going to get product market fit and bring 50 million people into this space? If I had to guess, it would be something around gaming or NFTs. I just think it it will be. I do think there is probably a different definition of product market fit for DeFi that is less about strictly the number of users that they have. And it probably has to do more with TVL and cash flow and real profits being extracted, right? Like the, an example of that would be Uniswap turning on the fee switch or something like that. And just by the way, Uniswap itself is an unbelievable success story. I mean, they've taken the entire, they're vertically integrating, you know, they've taken the wallet layer, you know, they've got their front end and the app, they've got the aggregation layer with X, the liquidity layer with four, and they'll probably launch their own chain at some point and get settlement too. I mean, it's a, I think there are success stories like that. I, I also think, um, I was actually having, I had a long drinks with a, a guy this week and people have been talking about the killer, you know, so in the internet, people are like, what is the killer app going to be? And people from the very beginning kind of had it, right? It was like social media, it was e-commerce, you know, they didn't really get uh, the the platform business model, but they had the ideas in the beginning and we've got non-sovereign money, you know, we've got, we've got a, a platform that you can build apps on permissionlessly. I mean, these are not nothing things. These are already hundred billion dollar outcomes. I 
sort of feel like there's this existential question about what are these things going to be. I think we're looking at a lot of the killer use cases already. They're just not mature. So not enough people are using them yet. And we're really worried about it. I would guess we're already looking at most of the, a lot of the major use cases, to be honest with you. Um, that's that's kind of how mm-hmm. I feel. And then you just need to be patient and, and wait that people will eventually use these things. Um, and I believe they will. I'm really optimistic about that. I would agree with that. I think we've got it with DeFi right now. Like DeFi is it, but I think what people get wrong is DeFi is a B2B business. It's not a B2C um, business. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we've got these like incredible, what almost look like, like it's like the crypto version of B2B SaaS businesses. It's like DeFi it has now like a dozen protocols that spit off a bunch of cash flow. They're sustainable. They've got massive businesses on top of them and funds that sit on top of them. And it's this like interoperable ecosystem for better or for worse. Uh, but then like actually this weekend, someone posted this question on Twitter being like, what apps would you miss the most if they left or something? And the first thing that came to mind for me, it was actually Blur and OpenSea. Like those are probably the two, uh, the two apps that I go go on the most um, is like Blur and OpenSea just for NFTs. So I've got to assume like it's something that we can't see yet, but it's going to be some NFT thing in 2025 probably. I mean, stable coins, right? Stable coins. Yeah, I, I, I was just interviewing Jesse from, from uh, Coinbase uh, yet again. And God, I mean, the whole vision of base is, makes me incredibly excited as, as a catalyst with account abstraction with USDC as that conduit, like, holy shit. Like, you know, he was talking about like a, a re like a, a restaurant points like a program that is deploying on base. And you're like, yeah, you could see the vision, right? You know, restaurants issue an NFT, that's your loyalty, you get points, and you pay with USDC. You don't even whip out Apple Pay, none of that jazz. Like it's just everything just works, right? <laughs> and yeah, I think Coinbase might just become that like everything app. Uh and it's incredibly exciting. Well, only thing I'll add to that um, is I totally agree. I think, you know, Mike, you said it well. People had the original ideas for what would ultimately end up working on the internet. The one, the one thing that I would add to that is it took catalyzing events for those things to become real, like SSL to make e-commerce actually work, and like the ability to take digital photos and upload them to make social media actually work. Like, I think that there's going to be sort of ex- extraneous, you know, third party events that make all these things real. Uh, and it's really hard to predict what those events will be. And it's more, you know, a social prediction than a, than a technological one in a lot of senses. But I think we have the ideas of what will work. It'll just be something that happens, you know, because some random event makes it possible. Yeah, Go- I totally Go agree. You know, who I think gets this really well is the Solana ecosystem and this kind of like this D pin. I think you can squint at DPIN, which is, um, and and see how this space might end up evolving. It's like stuff that takes place on crypto actually leverages hardware and might eventually influence hardware and then actions that people take in real life. I actually think it's clearly not where it ultimately needs to be, but I think you can squint at that and see a very attractive future for crypto actually. And it actually might solve this big problem of like, how do you incentivize gig workers and give them upside, which would be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But that's a little further out there. Guys, I have a, I have a question for you guys actually about Blockworks. Oh, here, we go. Um, here we go. Here we go. This is the part where Santi is really yeah. Third part. degree. <laughs> yeah, third, yeah, exactly. Um, you guys see a bunch of like bunch of businesses and pass on a bunch of businesses. I'm actually curious because never really asked you guys this. Like, why did you invest in Blockworks? What was the, what what was the reason? I mean, I'll, I'll go first. I think you know, Santiago said this at the start. Um, first and foremost, getting to know you guys and having that happen even long before there was uh, even you know the idea of an investment opportunity. Um, having the podcast together, listening to all the content, seeing the maturation of the business. Like I said, Vance and I literally went to, you know, whatever that Chicago uh, event Coin was. And when all the fun Coin symposium. Alt, that's what it was. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fun symposium. Where we were literally talking about fire blocks and, you know, custody yeah, yeah. and all the all the unsexy stuff. Um, but no, and watching the progression of everything um, and, you know, just having people on the Frameworks team, Framework team um, 
who can understand sort of the trajectories of media in the industry at a deeper level than than maybe like Vance and I would be paying attention to. And and you know Adam on our team talking about you guys and recognizing all of the the crazy stuff that was going on simultaneously and how everything was lining up. And then, you know, talking about the potential of the research platform and, and frankly, like the question that I thought was the most telling was, okay, you know, everybody has a research platform. Everybody's working on this. Or which one do you use? And the answer is like, well, I really kind of don't. And it's because there isn't one that has all of the encapsulated information in a digestible manner. And there is an opportunity to build that. Um, and, and sharing that vision, I think, you know, all of those things coinciding. Um, was what made it obvious for us. Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree with all that. Uh, yeah, people. I mean, I invest in people, but like, I'll give you a more concrete um, answer. I think media is counter-cyclical. Like, as, as I think of my portfolio, like you guys crank out news in any market environment, probably more in the bear market. Like engagement probably is higher in the bear market. And so I think it is a kind of a defensive position in my portfolio because people... Like you look at all these conferences, people still go to these conferences uh, in the bear market. And it is a very simplistic bet on the growth of the industry. You said earlier, right? If you believe this industry is going to be 10 trillion plus, then someone's going to have to cover that. And I think you guys have a pretty interesting diversified business model across events, which is back up, right? Uh, you have the research platform, which is, it, I, I didn't give any credit to that, candidly. I, like, okay, it's it's option value. But Nonetheless, like just just events can be highly lucrative, um, because it is an industry that people need to go to these events. I I had to go to these events to truly understand and connect with these special. Heck, that's where I met Stani. Had I not gone to DevCon in Osaka, I wouldn't have met Stani. Wouldn't have made the best investment of my career in crypto. Probably one of the best. And so I fundamentally believe that it is investing, and just this industry requires social interaction and there's no better way to do that than just going to these events and so and so that combined with the the fact that i was doing this podcast right and, and just seeing engagement and you know uh so but I, but i think as a as a and the last kind of piece which is a bet that i i don't know how it's going to play out but i do think that the media business and i don't i don't not an expert on on media i mean by any stretch of the imagination but i do think that operating a media business in crypto allows you to do so many interesting things that haven't been explored by traditional media companies. Meaning mm -hmm. from a retention standpoint, from an engagement standpoint, there's a lot the, that, and I think the design space will continue to open up, not particularly for you guys, as we get more regulatory clarity of how do you make your subscribers, your listeners, your viewers, even from different type mm -hmm. of subscription models um, to different types of just ownership um, and referral programs and all of that stuff. And look, I mean, the newspapers kind of went through this transition, right? Um, you know, the New York Times was kind of ahead of its game, but some others weren't ahead and then they just died. Going from like traditional print to like online and then like shifting their business model. So I think it was an incredible opportunity for a media business to leverage and harness a lot of the tools that crypto provides from NFTs to DeFi to micropayments to all the stuff that I, at some point you would have gotten really excited and then laughed out of the room because it didn't work. But I think it will work. Mm -hmm. It has to, yeah. like, I think the the early clues are there and the breadcrumbs are there to give you a lot of indication that you guys can do so much and you haven't even started exploring that because you've been too focused on just building quality content and stayed in your lane and I, and I look at that and I think, okay, now I think is a different inflection point. And I think it made sense to raise money at a time where you can really blow this out in an interesting way. Yeah. You know, it's funny you, you mentioned that, Santi, that last piece about, I don't know about DeFi and micropayments, but I also think there will be a great media business built leveraging NFTs. It's there because... Yeah. You know, if you if you're actually if you're a founder at all, you know the pain of trying to put something out there and getting people to care. This is Elon Musk's great magic is that he can make people care about things. And NFTs have this very I actually like the way Luca Nets talks about this. I got pudgy penguin pilled, but 
it's it's this like small <laughs> core group of people that really, really, really care. And that isn't something that you can sell millions of dollars of sponsorships against, but it's valuable. It's really valuable. Um yeah, I mean, you, you can, I mean, one of the you. other categories I'm really excited is prediction markets. And so them being like yeah. oracles for true information and you're kind of seeing, I mean, uh, buy some investment buy market, obviously, but like, so like, it's really fascinating the way that like you're surfacing a lot of information without having to corrupt. And I think Chris Dixon talks about this a lot in, in the journey of an influencer. It starts with really authentic content. It gets you that first 30,000, 100,000 followers. And then at some point in that curve, you realize that you need to corrupt yourself for better. And these people, I'm not saying these people are bad. I'm just saying because the platforms don't give them and don't share enough resources, don't a lot of the monetization that they get from selling ads, they have to sign sponsorships and do all this stuff. And the quality of the content degrades. And I think you guys have an opportunity to do things differently because crypto allows you to, i mean all the token model allows you to share more equitably with creators and so you think about having an organization like maybe it's not hiring another a thousand reporters maybe it is surfacing insight from the masses and then somehow having a way to curate that and rewarding people in a way through nfts or whatever you know i'm, I'm speaking out of my ass here but just uh, these are some ideas that i think you guys it's not going to be me right because i'm a terrible builder i i don't have a good enough imagination but you guys do and I think there's a lot of potential to to harness a lot of these things, right? To really change how information gets surfaced and also reported to increase the the veracity of that information. Santi, I agree with a lot of what you just said, but let me just poke at that one thing about sponsorship being the thing that Come degrades right. the right. quality of the content. The thing that I think especially influencers fall prey to is this audience capture, which is you get a reputation and a following and a brand saying it's usually like one small set of things. The things that work, the thing that works on social media are very small, simple repetition, speaking directly to a group of people. And then you see this all the time. People try to, once they get like 150 or 200,000 followers, break out of that mold and say different things and their following turns on them. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the business model. It's this. It's the way the algorithms reward mm -hmm. you, and then you're you build up a following and a business that might be dependent on that audience, and then you can't say different things because they will turn on you. And just look at like Bitcoin for a great example of that. You know, I mean, that's that's what happens over there. So. I don't know. I think that's the important. over there in those corners. Over, over there, I, well, over there. Well, but I oh, like I, Bitcoin I, a lot. I do, but I can't. It, it's hard, it's so hard to engage. It's yeah, so hard to engage now. You know. No, I mean, I, I've noticed the frustration. Like, I think a lot of the changes that has happened in Twitter now X have been good, like subscriptions and sharing payments or whatever. But it's also the you can see and in real time how changing the algorithm and how many likes you have it's just like it's yeah. it's very confusing and it's frustrating and i can't imagine how frustrating it would be for someone that de their livelihood depends on connecting with their audience like uh, for me i don't know but like for other people it's it's their it's their livelihood and these platforms change the algorithm on a whim and then you're you're royally screwed like you have to go back to ground zero and like reinvent your model so anyways a little bit of a tangent, but no, I think you guys are really primed to to take things a, a different level and show the industry what is possible engaging with like and reporting and creating quality. Like at the end of the day, surfacing truth and parsing signal through noise from noise and just, I think there's an interesting way to do that with the right incentives. Yeah. Agreed. What has been the worst mistake and how much do you think about it? I have a, an answer for you. That's a mistake we've made <laughs> like multiple times and will, and go. will probably keep on making. Mike's like, I made this mistake yesterday, <laughs> uh, which is not checking for rats in the podcast room. Wasn't there like <laughs> yeah. <one? laughs> yeah. I still remember this time. 
We did have a plant that died once and that was pretty terrible too. But no, I think it's, it is underestimating the complexity that happens at higher numbers of people. Like Jason said, I kind of had this idea that you'd come up with strategy, but like you get this from listening to a lot of podcasts, which you can probably tell I do. But you know, the way people tell, talk about it on stories is you have this inspiration or this idea and you go do this thing and that's not really what it is at all. And really most of like managing people is just hard people problems and like listening to people and talking to them and organizing them and moving them in a direction. And at every single juncture where we've done real aggressive amounts of hiring, Jason and I, I think we've underestimated the amount of time it would take to integrate more people and get them bought into the same thing that you are bought into. So I don't know if there's any one drastic, like, oh, we did zigged when we should have zagged, but it's these, it's this small thing of underestimating the amount of work that that is. Yeah. I, I would, I I was going to say the exact same thing. It's like sub 10 people is the entrepreneurial stage, right? Things are super informal, super fluid. Pre COVID, we were all in an office together. Just like you could shout at someone. That's the, that's the first stage. Second stage is 10 to 50 people. That's like the delegation stage where like Mike and I had to learn how to like get things off our plate and like we couldn't actually do everything. Um, And like the two challenges there become like communication and coordination, I think. And then we're in the, like what I would call the professionalization stage, which is, for the first time we need like standardization and like product, like processes and procedures, which pre this phase, I was like, we'll never have that. That's what slows companies down. Like, and now here we are, we need it. And I, I totally see why it happens. And then the next stage, like I'm sure as soon as we get this stage figured out, we're going to be at hundred people. And that's the next stage is like hundred to 500, which I guess you could probably call like the specialization stage. Like, and that the challenge there is like silos form and like communication and collaboration between departments gets super hard. And then you figure that mm-hmm. out and then you become, and then, and then you hit the bureaucracy, bureaucracy stage, which I'm assuming just like agility becomes the main pain point there. But Commun- communication. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you have a deeper appreciation for organizational growth and challenges. Um, does that yeah. make you more or less bullish on DAOs and govern on chain governance? <laughs> That's a phenomenal question, Fonte. <laughs> it has been I know me. my answer. Yeah. Mike, you go first. I think DAOs DAOs have been like a very broad brush, which is let's let's just start with what doesn't work. Totally flat hierarchy. Doesn't matter what kind of organization you are, it should be flat. I think everyone agrees at this point that that doesn't work. Except what I, but yeah. Okay. Except for Ray. (laughs) So what I, what I now think is that there's going to be a broad, the style of governance that you have to have needs to fit the product that you're making. And what it need, what I mean by that is like something like Ethereum actually needs to be extremely decentralized, right? Like that is the base layer of how all of this stuff works. The value proposition is, is, proposition is that it's credibly neutral, et cetera. One layer up from that, Lido. Lido needs to almost be as decentralized as Ethereum itself. And that, Santi, is, you know, it's actually a part of the value proposition. If Lido isn't very decentralized, then everyone's going to be worried about the ability to co-opt it through the governance token and really mess with how Ethereum works and secures itself. So the way that Lido can actually gain more market share is by decentralizing its governance, implementing a staking router, dual governance, Steeth LDO, that kind of thing. All the way up here at like a game, does that need to be that decentralized? I don't think so. I mean, that doesn't, that's not critical infrastructure that I think people depend on. And actually the analogy, if you want to look at it, is kind of like different layers of regulation in companies in the world. So the government is has to be really fair and transparent. One layer up from that is maybe like utilities, you know, and they don't get to make a lot of money because everyone really depends on them, like healthcare, financials, all these different things. I think what we've, the mistake that we've made is to try to paint a broad brush and apply the same level of uh, decentralization that Ethereum needs to every little DAO. And that doesn't make much sense. So I think what'll probably happen over the coming years is we'll get more of an understanding of, okay, for a decentralization or for a decentralized exchange, 
you know, these core things need to be decentralized, but a lot of the product stuff, you can actually just organize that like a company and that's okay. Completely agree with that. Good take. Yeah, I agree. Cool guys. This has been fun. What else should we talk about? Anything else? (laughs) Do you hate us already? As investor, as investor. <laughs> yeah. no. I, have a you guys. I have a question for you guys. Um, what yep. percentage of your portfolio companies send investor updates and are they monthly, quarterly, and how useful do you actually find them? <clears throat> hmm. And does it depend if you're the lead versus like just participating? If you're sending an update, you're sending an update. Um, I would say most do it also depends on which stage like okay we're talking about a protocol like an ave or you know something that's you know, scaled and you can follow along in the governance forums and that's gonna be the best place to get the updates if it's something that hasn't launched yet um or isn't really scaling yet definitely um basically if there's no way of understanding from the outside looking in what's going on definitely um and whether that's a protocol or a company um how useful uh, they're useful it's important to understand where things are how things are trending any things that are coming up that you don't know about that could be negative how you're gonna have to deal with it that type of stuff um how how we should be thinking about fundraising like there's all kinds of stuff that gets put in there um it's more it's less like i i hate it personally when you just get the constant everything's positive everything's great here we go like i what you want to put in there is here's the things that aren't going well and here's the things that i think in the next three months aren't going to go well but we're going to find out just to be able to understand um i don't know my personal perspective i think uh the best founders know how to utilize their investor base at the right time the worst Mm. ping you all the time and or too little too late and i think you the best founders have an appreciation that like, yeah, you can ping me on telegram, but I'm getting a hundred thousand messages on telegram, but it's also nice to, to get the update because I'll read the update. And I think it's, I can go back to that update and then revisit it over time. I also think writing is an incredible tool to organize your thought process, especially as a founder in crypto. I mean, you guys even mentioned it throughout this podcast. It is chaotic out there. And I think, the probability for a founder to stay focused, but also really get really get the help of investors. Um, at the end of the day, it is a partnership, and I think the best way to do that is really communicating um, well. And I think the best channel for me is getting an update. Uh, there's pushback. It's like, hey, how much time should I spend on this? Like, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you do it consistently in the right format, you know. This is what we wanted to accomplish. These were the hypotheses, low lights, like things that didn't go well, things that we need help on and call to actions and like things that went well, right? Like th- that format, like my brain's already conditioned to like read it like that. And I sometimes I just jump to the very bottom where they need help. And I think I would highly, highly encourage as much as I hate bureaucracy and added work, take it, take it 30 minutes to an hour to write it out and send it to your investors. I think it's incredibly valuable and there's there's a lot of upside to doing that. And to your other point, you know, cadence really is, it just depends on when you're going to have a, a media update. If there's nothing that changed between one month or another, you know, wait another month. Yep. But even send, you could just send that. Guys, no yeah, material update right. this month, on to the next month. Like, yep. simple as that. Mm. That's a really good point, Santi. Yeah. Cool, guys. Yeah, well, this has been great. We are, for, especially uh, in this environment... <laughs> Sometimes you want to understand, hey, are these guys alive? Like, uh, they just they run away with their money? Or, <laughs> I mean, look, look, guys, like 20%, over, a, I think now at this point, a third of the companies in the cohort, between 20 and 30% of like just close shop. There's so a way to let, do that. Let me ask you guys from your investor seat, from your entrepreneur seat, as you know, the head of framework or, how do you talk to people who are losing faith or how do you like, how do you talk to people or like, uh, is this market ever going to come back? Like, am I, is, does this really make sense? I mean, geez, everyone's losing all this money in DeFi. I mean, what do you say to people who have that perspective? 
I think as, we, as we've been talking about, you have the green shoots of innovation that are actually starting to work. We talked about, you know, the self-sovereign money, $5 trillion or whatever the number is now of, you know, stable coins have been settled on chain. You've got DeFi scaling. You've got three or four different protocols within DeFi that are cash flow positive. Um, you've got this consistent interest, you know, and it ebbs and flows over a month or two, but consistent interest in NFTs as a consumer product, whether that manifests itself in games or artwork or loyalty rewards like that, I truly believe NFTs will be in some format of a consumer application that scales to, to hundreds of millions of consumers. Um, all that stuff is happening. And if you just play back the tape and think about what it was like in 2018, 2019, you know, when all of us were really kind of uh, cutting our teeth on this industry, uh, there was no hope. There was nothing that was really kind of green shoots. DeFi didn't exist. Stable coins sort of existed, but you you had to reinvent the entire narrative. Um, and so I'm I'm a very strong believer in you know the things that uh, don't kill you ultimately make you uh, stronger from and from an industry perspective. And and I think you know we're gonna we're gonna be able to prove that out over this next cycle. Um, and also, it's not really. I mean, yes, we've we've definitely inflicted some of our own wounds this go around, and and I'm actually really happy to see the charlatans and grifters get get pushed out. Mm. Um, and I think that that cleansing is also really healthy. Um, so, you know, there's there's positives, and we've gotten rid of negatives. And you know, from that perspective, it, it feels obvious. I was thinking about that over the weekend and just today. Like, there is. And especially as a result of interviewing someone like Jesse at Coinbase, like if you go and talk to builders, I think most of them today are actually really optimistic and, and motivated, the real ones. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is it, join. And, and, and of course, someone say, wait a minute, but you get to talk to founders, but I, you know, I'm a normie. How do I do that? Join Discord groups. They're bumping. Synthetics Discord group was a party town in the lowest point. There, there was like an inverse correlation between the level of excitement from real people that were like using this stuff that ultimately ended up doing extremely well because they, they were at the ground level at the in the lowest point of the token, literally, which is what probably what framework bought. Anyways. Uh, if you go and talk, and so I think I always, as an investor, like maybe I'm trying to under like create a framework here of like, w you know, at what point in the cycle you are when there's a very big disparity between the level of excitement from a builder and investors. And I think we are at that point. We're at a low point for sure. Um, the conference and, indicator. What was that? First it's the conference indicator. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> If they're yeah. a bunch of developers, you buy. If it's a bunch exactly. of investors, you sell. Yeah, you, like ECC, right? I mean, bumping, right? Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think that's one. You said it also, Michael. Like, I, I'm not here to convince people, like, trying to pull them in, right? I ultimately think we do have to deliver on, on beautiful 10x, faster, better, cheaper products. I think we'll get there. Uh, we tweeted this weekend about, like, adoption. Look, we're infrastructure, we can't blame infrastructure this time around. But to your point, Michael, from Framework, something you said is really great, which is we're now debating which use cases and what's gonna what's real and what's not. There was nothing in 2018. Like literally, it was, it was just white papers. And so the existential risk of this industry, in my mind, has gone away. It's more of a question now, and I think you do re revisit history and you say, the internet lived through this moment. And so, and we lived through this. And so I think it's, again, like, think about like in 2001, like who imagined that you would have had a smartphone and then everything else that happened after that? No one, literally no one. And that wasn't too long ago. And so... I, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel, obviously, it's not easy. There's been a lot of pain. The, the, the sheer aggregate value destruction, temporary, or is, is, is hard to process. Um, but uh, I think, uh, for me, I, I, you know, I'm a solo shop, so I just talk to founders. If there's a day that I feel like, God, yeah. No, I mean, it's just really I like a bald and all this crap. I'd be like, God damn it. Again, just, I go talk to builders. And to me, that's always the best reminder of, 
yeah, okay. Smartest people I know are here. And, and look, there's been a number of times since I've been a part of this industry, more than three or four, where I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to pack up my shit and go. <laughs> like, like this is too much. Like, this I have is trouble why- seeing you do that. No, 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 no. I, 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 I said it. Do. No, no, no. How, many time, how many times have I heard? I've said this to you many times. Like, I, this is why, guys, sorry, I'm going to say it. I hate going to conferences for this reason. Because the, the, the normal conferences, like, God, man, at the peak of every bull market, it's like that scene in like the big short where they go to Vegas in the mortgage association and they leave and they're like literally <laughs> short it all. Pump it all, pump it all. <laughs> and, and you go to like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Miami was just like one of those where you're like, good Lord. Like, or Breakpoint 2021. Breakpoint was a. Yeah. Like, yeah, top yeah. like oh my God. And, and so. Those are the hardest moments, to be fair. <laughs> it's uh, not. Nah. So anyways, like it's a reminder. We're all human, of course. Like th- anyone that says a crypto is easy, God, spend another month or two and you'll realize that it's not. It's not easy. And I think it's just a virtue. We're very early. So, yeah. you know, you're not going to convince people that don't want convincing. And so I sort of just, Michael, that was a great, your advice to your mom. Gives, I'll take that. She's a wise, wise woman. It, it definitely sounds like one. And so uh, I, I, that's my biggest learning this podcast, you know? Mm. I think more energy should be focused on pushing founders to to execute on delivering beautiful products. Like there's really no excuse at this time, I think, with account abstraction, with all the L2s. Like we, we can really, we have a really good opportunity in the next two, three years to deliver. Things take time, but now is the time, I think. The infra is ready. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate you guys, uh, oh, you guys. letting us flip this. Yeah, I'll say. Great to flip it around. Yeah. He does that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, guys. Uh, everyone here is going to be a permissionless? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, baby. Good stuff. <laughs> be, good be there. <laughs> be there. Let's go buy a we always have to plug permissionless, you know, there's a huge purple yeah. banner that will show up right now. <laughs> Someone asked me, what's the biggest difference now that you have investors versus not? I'm like, well, now that Santi is an equity owner of BlockWorks, he finally shills permissionless. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a year and a half, I'm like, Santi, little promo for permissionless, little thing, never once. Now, pumping it more than I am. You know what the, you know uh, what the biggest change is now as an investor? So I get to go now for free to permission. <laughs> I'm a speaker and he said, you were paying for your ticket. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I didn't get the number. This is why these guys have been bootstrapped for five years. They even charge speakers. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Got to keep the lights on, Santi. Got to yeah, keep the know. lights on. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, guys. Hey, this has been a real treat. All right, fellas. Yeah. We can wrap. Thanks, everyone, for listening.